Estrada. And, uh, good afternoon, dear panelists, dear moderator, dear our dear guests. So welcome to ICC Riga Top 101 Panel Discussion 2024. So we are here today to discuss a very uh, widely discussed topic today because old medias are full with the conversation about should the state-owned companies come to the uh, public market, should the state-owned companies uh, become public and uh, come to our stock exchange, is it the right time, should we revive the financial markets, and we are here to discuss this today. So we could argue that we have seen this discussion before, and in 2017, the topic was brought on the table by the government, and uh, afterwards it was on pause. Uh, I myself, I'm with the Baltic Financial Market since 2002, and I definitely have seen the conversation like this before, but the result we all know. Uh, and also, we could mention that there are factors like the scope of the market, the liquidity issues, the, uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, geopolitical risk being added, and so on. So we, we could, uh, we could uh, put this, this list quite long, but uh, I would not uh, agree fully because uh, the things are being changed, the things are changing, in fact. And we have the Capital Markets Union Initiative coming from the European Commission, which, which aims to in general, make the capital market available for the whole Europe and make investors easy access to the, for the investing purposes, the companies, even the smaller companies, access the financial market uh, raised funds and not go to the banks. So the, those things are happening very actively. And also uh, the investors, um, I have um, uh, asked my dear year one students to, to fill in the survey and to answer how many of them are actually investing, and uh, the results I got was about 50% of the uh, students are actually investing. So there is why if we say that investors are not active, I would argue about this, because those are year ones, they haven't had their investment courses yet, so they have their limited funds. So, all in all, we're here today, and the question is, is it the time when there is such a strong political will, will when we actually will see the change in Latvian financial market? Is it the time when we have the uh, raising geopolitical race, the time when the m and deals are good and, and are happening in the region? So we, we are going to have a very active discussion today. I hope you will participate a lot. So we are going to start with the opening speeches by Liana Dubova, CEO of, of Nasdaq Baltic, and Carlos Krasnich, the managing partner of uh, Prudencia. So welcome to SSC Riga one more time. Floor is yours, uh, Carlis or Liana. Okay. Lavakar, uh, hello to everyone. So glad to be here, like uh, again in January. I would like to thank you SSC. I would like to thank you Nasdaq and uh, my colleagues Prudential. So you know we have this top 101 for the 18 years in, in Latvia and four years in uh, in Estonia and the Baltic top is some seven years uh, both top, Baltic top 30 uh, done by us. So, yeah, I think it's really good that we have this opportunity to talk uh, to you, uh, dear colleagues here, to share some information that we have gathering. Uh, yeah, so of course, I guess in the Baltics, we are used to work in tough environment. Uh, we have not been maybe so overflown by some cheap money or some super hype interest from different type of investors. So we are like always, uh, I, th I think, be on, on some edge of the European market, uh, ready for some tough environment, and maybe, maybe work harder than other big guys somewhere in big financial centers. So yeah, but I guess despite all those uh, risks that uh, uh, was mentioned here, uh, geopolitical risks, uh, interest rates uh, going up and uh, inflation and so on and so on, uh, last year was not so bad, of course challenging, but we have seen in Latvia again some good IPOs coming uh, and hopefully this year will show us as well some positive uh, events. We have seen m and deals in energy, in, in IT industry happening, uh, relatively large deals. There are uh, deals uh, coming uh, in this year and January was already with some announcement, announcements quite interesting. So I think uh, life goes on. 
I hope this uh, discussion will bring you some new ideas and a new energy. Thank you. Yeah. I will use this one. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's so a pleasure to see so many of you here present, and of course, uh, hello to those who watch us online. So uh, I will be a bit more philosophical, let's say so. Uh, a recipe for business success demands a good blend of ingredients and precise execution. And among these components, the ability to transition into the listed, publicly listed company on the stock exchange stands out. To be listed signifies more than a financial milestone. It reflects a commitment to a long-term strategy and ambitious plan for future growth. It also signals the company's success in attracting investors. Those individuals who share the company's ambition and is ready to risk. Nasdaq Baltic companies in the past five years have demonstrated their appeal to investors, securing almost 4 billion euros on the Nasdaq Baltic market. Nearly half of this amount was attracted, was raised through public offerings. Quite a good result, right? But we aim for more. Being listed not only showcases a company's ambition and maturity, but also provides an opportunity for small and medium-sized companies to enter the Nasdaq Baltic first north market and go public with relative ease. Latvian government has introduced a financial support program aimed uh, at partially compensating listing costs. Uh, so encouraging companies to take this strategic decision and get listed. It's planned to be launched this spring. Being listed underscores a company's commitment to good corporate governance, an important ingredient for long-term business strategy success, and I can prove it. The corporate governance and transparency indicators of listed companies surpass those of their counterparts in the top 101 list by twofold. So today, we are going to dive into the drivers and challenges surrounding IPOs and m as deals, and I eagerly anticipate our discussion on these very crucial topics. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Arvid Sostomaros. Uh, I will be moderating the, the panel uh, today. We, uh, I have been uh, advising on M&A deals for, for 25 years, and uh, this, uh, this topic is very close to my heart, and I sometimes also entertain myself by coming to SSC Riga and uh, teaching students primarily on business valuation and hopefully also giving some optimism uh, to, to young and bright uh, minds here to, about capital markets as well. So um, today we have a very interesting uh, panelist, so very diverse, very experienced guys. So I see also many students present, so there is a hope that some of the insights and advice that's going to be shared might be passed to, so to say, to next generations who hopefully make this world better than we know it today. So uh, let me ask uh, the panelists to take uh, seats in front of the audience, and I will then introduce each of you. Yep. Please welcome. So the setup of, uh, of the panel will be that uh, we'll start with the questions that I have uh, prepared and I'll ask uh, the panelists uh, for their views and, and, and sharing their experience. And then I trust that you will do me a favor and, uh, and after these nice and, and, uh, and comfortable questions that I'm going to ask, you will uh, ask really challenging questions to our panelists so they feel 
also some a little bit of grilling as well, right? Can we agree on that? Good. Okay, so um, so from today's panel, we have uh, actually uh, I looked LinkedIn profiles of, uh, of of those who are present, and I I see we have uh, in addition to me two alumni of the school. We have four people who have uh, worked um, with SCB at some point in time. Uh, we have three of them who have worked with uh, with uh, Citadelle. So quite a concentration, I would say. But uh, as you see, very experienced individuals. And I'll start introduction with ladies. So you saw already Natalia. So in addition to uh, being associate uh, uh, professor here at SC Riga, she's a board member also of uh, FinTech Latvia for seven years or so. Uh, also has been head of brokerage at SCB. Uh, served in, at NASDAQ Council, and uh, sometime also at Citadel, right? So, so um, Agnes Ozolkaya, board member, Riga students, I understand uh, has been uh, so brave to take a uh, uh, career, drastic career change from banking to, uh, to uh, Riga Water very recently, so hopefully we'll hear also some very fresh insights and experiences uh, from, uh, from uh, her. Then we have uh, Klaus uh, Vasks, investor, entrepreneur, and uh, experienced uh, supervisory board uh, member and a chairman, currently um, um, chairman of, uh, of Air Baltic and uh, TET. Right, uh, Air Baltic quite recently from last year and uh, three years TET. And then previously 12 years uh, uh, similarly in supervisory board at uh, Citadella. Right, and then we have uh, Jochen Ackerblom from uh, Citadella, CEO of the bank for about four years. Uh, previously CFO and then uh, also about 10 years with SEB Group. And Maris, Maris Simonovic, uh, CEO of uh, EcoBaltia, um, about 10 years or so in, in, in this role, but many more years uh, in the industry, and also alumni of the school. So very welcome um, to, this, uh, to this discussion, and uh, I'll start with, uh, with, with the questions. So before before uh, actually running into questions, we have uh, we have two broad topics: uh, IPOs uh, and M&A. And um, I'll start with uh, start with uh, IPOs. On one hand, uh, somebody might be saying that actually, in both of these areas, nothing is happening in the Baltics, and uh, maybe that's because the markets are small. Then now uh, maybe we are happy also to think that small is beautiful and things like this, but. Um, uh, the community that is doing the deals is not, not so big, and we don't have so many companies that are very, very active in, uh, in uh, I IPO or M&A areas. But just to give a little bit of a context um, about our financial system, so two key criteria that characterize development of, of financial system are indicators loans to GDP and that has been quite debated over the last couple of years how far we are lagging and the second is market capitalization to GDP and there the situation is even is even worse so if in Estonia market capitalization to GDP is around 17 percent Lithuania 9 percent then Latvia is only 3 percent and that's in comparison to EU uh, average of 54%. Latvian government has set uh, ambitious target to reach Lithuania level about 9% by 2027. And unlike in uh, Lithuania and, and Estonia, we don't have in Latvia any state-owned 
or municipality-owned companies really in the equity market. So when we talk about IPO challenges uh, in, the, in the Baltics, uh, certainly low liquidity, small market, unpredictable results, that's all coming to, uh, to mind. While, um, as Natalia mentioned, uh, so investor interest is growing, so giving some, some hope. And, and maybe let's start with uh, Jochen with you, uh, as you are one of, one of those uh, um, most ru rumored, I would say, yeah? uh, potential IPOs. And uh, so it has been public that, that you have been uh, considering IPO, and um, we're keen to learn what you can disclose, what have been challenges in, uh, in decision-making regarding this, What's, what how our environment has impacted decisions, and uh, are you still sort of on those plans? Um, I mean, f I think that the numbers you're, you sort of brought up is a bit striking about the situation, right? So uh, Latvia is unfortunately lagging uh, when it comes to the uh, capital markets. Uh, and that's something that, that we have been exploring when we look at strategic options. So we can, you know, when we look at strategic options, we put a lot of different uh, alternatives on the plate, uh, including IPO. And being, uh, let's say, the biggest Latvian local bank uh, in that sense, being sort of only focused on the Baltics, uh, obviously our first choice if we would do an IPO would be to list in Riga because it's also in our interest to help the capital markets develop. Um, then, uh, but, but I mean, we would basically break completely new grounds if we would list in Riga, because uh, the size that we would have and the, basically the free float that we would do would be something that doesn't exist. So always when you break grounds, it's good, but it also creates uncertainty. Uh, and the way IPOs works is that investors, they want certainty, not uncertainty. And investors, they want to see that there's been, you know, a healthy uh, secondary, that there is a working, uh, you know, there's a, there's a flow of trades. Uh, it's not only one-off with, with, you know, one IPO that feeds another. Um, so that has been considerations we've been making. Uh, and we've also been exploring the possibility to do dual listings. And then the question is, where do you pair up? And to be frank, I think the dual listings that we've seen in the Baltics has been quite unsuccessful. I mean, they've been successful at the attempt, but they, have, they haven't been sustainable. So there's been attempts with London, there's been attempts with Helsinki. All of those are kind of on the wind down. Uh, so again, there we would again break new grounds. Uh, but I think we, we still look at IPO as an option, um, but... Um, and, and we would love to pioneer, but then there comes the question, how ready is the Latvian society to invest into stocks? Because right now, as you said, what was it, 4% of GDP, 3%. So that 3% maybe will become 4% if we were listed, uh, which is good, but then we basically have to create 33% new market that is not active today, and that's huge. Uh, and that's one of the things that we debate, you know, can that be done? Um, so we've seen in Estonia that there is a local market, there's a retail market. In Lithuania, I would say the retail market is more questionable. And in Latvia, it has actually never been tried. Because if we do, you know, 5, 10, 15 million issues, it doesn't really test the market. If you want to really have real capital markets, you need to have 100, 150 million, 200 million that's really testing the depth of the market and the willingness from the investors. So it's, it's a bit of chicken and the egg. And I think, you know, this is like a, I think it's like a, a triangle of things that needs to work. So you need to have companies that are ready to take public. You need to have an infrastructure and a political system that supports it. And then you need to have local investors that are ready to take the lead. Because if you don't have the local investors, you won't get the international investors. And we think we're ready for IPO if we want to choose that. When it comes to sort of the infrastructure, the political systems, I would say uh, we didn't get the support that we wished for. Uh, I mean, just the fact that the government introduced a banking tax 
in the middle of our IPO process doesn't really help our dialogues with investors. Yeah, it's like we had uh, too little uncertainty already in the market. I yeah. agree. Yeah. So, so that, that is something we have had um, you know, many discussions on. Unfortunately, the outcome is what it is, and we just have to live with it. Uh, and then when it comes to infrastructure, we also had discussions with Nasdaq Baltic, because it also depends on how accessible the trading system is, the custody systems, uh, the CSDs, and so forth. I think Latvia is okay, but it could be improved, but it's also a little bit, again, chicken and the egg. Do you invest before, or do you prove the case, and then you invest? Um, and then the third one, that's the biggest unknown, and that is the appetite from the local investor community. Yeah, so, so, one, so, is, so one is re retail, so, uh, but then also sort of institutional, also our pension funds, where, yes. where they are investing, really. Exactly, yeah. and I think the pension fund system, um, I mean, this is also debatable, but if you really want to get the capital markets going in small countries like this, the pension system has to be ready to support that local market. And if you take the pension funds today, it's a very, very small portion that actually goes back into the Baltics. You're right. Um, let, so, let yeah. Me, yeah. Let me also ask, so, so we saw in December uh, Indexo trying to, uh, for second time, to get uh, funding for, for the bank. And they, I think, attracted something like 9 million of 12 million targeted. So what's your take from, from, from this? Um, I mean, I cannot say anything about the list or the, the secondary as such, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't give me much confidence that if I need to raise 100 million mm. or more, if they want to get 11 and they get 9, and I think a lot of that nine actually came from existing shareholders as well. You know, it, it, it doesn't really give me proof that there is a debt in the market. But then I think, you know, can we compare index with us? That's a different story. Mm. Um, so so um, if they would have had a four times over subscription, that would be something that I can read into. But the nine versus 11, you know, I can't make any conclusions that I didn't know from before. Right, okay. And uh, Klaus, maybe uh, to you as Air Baltic, uh, is sort of seems to be the front runner in, in, in talking about IPO, um, and um, seen as front runner by the government as well. So it has been also mentioned that dual listing might be might be in place. Is is that sort of addressing the small market, or or you have too many other factors to consider before before that? I think that uh, dual listing probably is not uh, in the top 10 priorities when we are discussing the IPO at all. And uh, I guess uh, that decision probably will be, uh, if that process will, will, will going to start, I mean, that, that decision will be probably made uh, later in the process, uh, what investment banks uh, will advise us when they talk with investors and, uh, and so on. But uh, right now we are actually uh, focusing only uh, on Riga, but, uh, but that decision might uh, change. Yeah. But uh, very much what uh, Johan said, I mean, uh, if that in case of Citadel, that might be a hundred uh, mil kind of uh, case, and for Air Baltic, of course, uh, uh, for company to grow and to achieve their business plan, uh, we are looking for like uh, 300 mil. And that, of course, is completely uh, different uh, different size and a different approach. Uh, of course, we have a millions of loyal customer base, uh, which we expect kind of to also contribute uh, to, to the potential IPO, because uh, most of our NPS of the, as a company kind of says that uh, the comp these are very loyal and uh, satisfied uh, clients, but uh, still the investor base probably will come from a different places and actually uh, the recent news about the Estonian, Lithuanian governments being interested so might create also the attraction in uh, in a broader uh, Baltic um, Baltic scope and uh, also uh, maybe as a, the governments as a partial investors might be might be welcomed. But I mean that's uh, the playground nobody kind of has played uh, so far, and 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 that will be. Really, really, really challenging. But of course, I mean, as a management supervisory board, uh, we are now really kind of focusing on uh, making operations uh, results kind of to be 
positive uh, and uh, the growth of the company to be kind of uh, uh, one that kind of leads us to sell this uh, business uh, at a good uh, and uh, create this kind of traction in the market yeah. and 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 uh, and definitely first quarter uh, when we announce the 2023 results i think that will be the, the best uh, ever year for uh, for our baltic so far and uh, we are looking forward also for 24 to be kind of a good year for us uh, but of course in aviation industry of course the scale uh, means everything. So I would say that we are just right now above a break even in in, in terms of uh, of the 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 market uh, and the, the operations. I think that our plans to double the fleet by 20, uh, 2030 is when we kind of will really reach uh, the profitability and the revenues we are uh, aiming for. But and and that's not a, uh, really kind of Latvian scale business that's really the Baltics and Scandinavia because I mean uh, we're really not talking about Latvia we are talking about the Baltics and uh, um, Eastern Europe uh, as a player and, and that would be also the message to the market when we go to IPO that uh, this is not we should not look at this as a small Latvian business it's now uh, already uh, re creating attraction to the our main uh, competitors and partners in Europe like uh, uh, bigger uh, aviation groups would you would you say that uh, investigating and deciding on IPO and preparing for it with a shareholder being a state among the shareholders does this has any peculiarities um, I would say that the state is uh, very motivated, I mean, to agree to sell the part and uh, the company goes in IPO because, I mean, we need that money uh, formally to uh, exit the state support uh, conditions which we had because we received the state uh, aid during the COVID uh, when the company was closed almost for you know, two months at all and uh, not flying properly for two years. But uh, we need to achieve a certain valuation of the business so that the government can still stay as a shareholder at some uh, portion in the company. But I mean, then we get off of the state support rules uh, from Europe. Uh, and uh, I don't see so much kind of issues there. Of course, there will be discussions. I mean, what special conditions will uh, government kind of want to depending from their share in the final valuation of the business uh, what they will want to kind of keep the the Riga as a main base uh, and uh, some other kind of uh, conditions but uh, uh, I don't feel there is a discrepancy or or something uh, not achievable yeah. right but as as at least in Latvia we have pretty long list of various exemptions this cannot be privatized still use that term in in discussions about IPOs. Uh, so the list of the ones who could potentially go or who are prepared is not is not that long. And uh, currently that list is extremely short. Do you have do you feel a pressure just just because of that as well? Not so much of, of that. I mean, uh, we are more kind of we need an equity to grow. And basically, that's our number one uh, motivator. I mean, we need a good uh, equity based capital for the company i mean to be uh, to decrease our leverage uh, to be more kind of uh, stronger capitalized and and that's only kind of uh, motivation that's growth and to be more uh, financially sound uh, company N not n not the fact that uh, somebody is pushing uh, for for ipo that's oh, not uh, okay. number one um Agnes, so you are sort of now in a company who has um, immense capex, capex needs, uh, and um, also have been mentioned as one of the most advanced companies owned by Riga City that could go to the capital markets, either bonds or potentially IPOs in, in, in future. What's, uh, what's your take? Uh, is, this, uh, is this feasible? for uh, municipal companies? Are they ready? Will they be ready ever? 
Uh, firstly, I would say yes, I can confirm that uh, our investment plan is quite substantial. But another uh, notice I would say that part of the investments are related uh, to the environment uh, requirements that will be applicable after 10 years. Actually, we need to predict future what uh, will happen after 10 years. Uh, we should evaluate this uh, climate change risks and so on. But in short term, I would say that we have quite uh, uh, financially stable and uh, capable uh, to use the lower cost uh, equity like uh, loans and, uh, and uh, bonds. And that's the first priority. Um, regarding uh, listing, I would say that during next two years, I'm not believe that it will happen, to be honest. But during this two years period, we have several strategic steps what we, how we could improve market value for the company. Uh, we have several activities uh, on uh, corporate governance that is already noticed. Uh, we, uh, this week, actually, we uh, approved our partnership uh, with international credit rating company. We have IT strategy. We try to align all investments to taxonomy requirements. And uh, currently, we are in the middle of the process of long-term financial strategy. One of the scenarios is to be listed. But till that, we do as much as possible to be ready to do that. Right. So, uh, Tallinn Water Company, they are listed in actually quite uh, quite long time, since 2005. Do you compare yourselves to them? And are there any lessons for you in, um, in going to the capital markets? Uh, from Tallinn West experience, I would sh uh, say that it was a valuable lesson from the process side. But in that time, in 2005, there was different reason why they do that. Actually, the money that comes from listing was taken out from, uh, from the shareholder side to support their core business. In uh, our scenario, it's not the case. We are expected to support our de development plans. Uh, another, um, uh, I would say, aspect is that in that time, listing was based also to the income uh, that is not strictly regulated, and it takes for, for them for several court processes over the years. It's not the Latvian case. Uh, in comparing uh, or less uh, uh, thinking about their journey, I would say if we have clear business plan where to invest, I would say that it will be benefit for the company and to the customers. Uh, from this experience, there, there we can see that trust for the listing company is higher. But, but still, you seem quite reserved about um, potential listing of uh, municipal companies in, uh, in five years or so. I would not say in five years, but maybe sooner, but uh, personally we need to, to receive strong support and the support should be based on exact business plan. And, and would you be using uh, bonds as a, as a test? Yes, I would say yes. Or, or just to get, get uh, extra funding? Uh, I would say that bonds uh, could be used as, uh, to diversify our credit portfolio. And it was it will it could be the right tool uh, how to give this uh, con confirmation that there is interest to invest in in such an industry where profitability is limited. Okay, uh, Natalia, sort of strong strong market needs both investors and these opportunities. The market is very s small. I'm not very optimistic about from what I know and what I hear is that the quick explosive growth is coming. Uh, what's, what's your take? What, what really sort of needs to be uh, changed or, or, or stimulated in some way that we actually see? Even these uh, uh, mediocre 9% of GDP in 2027. Yes, yeah, so the market is supply and demand. And um, from the company's perspective, so the company is attracting the money in the market, uh, what is positive is that we see that, let's say, from the IPO, from the uh, money attracted uh, via IPO, the numbers are raising. And finally, we're from zero. Uh, during the last five years, we are becoming, uh, we're getting more and more money. But if we are compared to the, uh, on the Baltic scope, so what is done in uh, Estonia, Lithuania, so our bond activity is around 30% of what is happening uh, during the last five years. And the Baltic market and our 
IPO activity is only 3%. So we are still quite, uh, quite on the modest side. Uh, half of the uh, amounts are coming from, is coming from Lithuania and uh, the rest is coming from Estonia. So um, on the um, uh, investor side, and this was uh, the challenges as brought by my colleagues, um, what I have uh, not uh, mentioned what I was, when I was telling that I, I asked uh, my students so if they are investing in the, in, the, uh, in the financial markets and around half of them told that yes, but only six persons out of um, around half 100 told that they are investing in the Baltics. And the companies they have mentioned were Enefit, uh, Most, and then Virshi. Uh, I was happy to see Virshi. Uh, but uh, again, uh, bringing us back to the uh, to the discussion today, the state-owned companies and uh, the interest from the investors. Uh, another thing is that um, uh, what is mentioned by the uh, European Commission, uh, Capital Markets Union, again bringing uh, this. So they are looking extremely positive at the uh, situation in Sweden. Uh, that uh, that uh, uh, there is a uh, very good uh, taxation for the investments and the changes in the pension system. So on the European Union, it's a uh, level European Commission recognized that pension should be some um, amendments potentially. They, they are not uh, telling anything, but uh, it should be done on that side so that the investors are becoming more active. Right. I, and I think for, uh, for companies, sort of if we look at the Baltic uh, equity market, so even textbooks say as that going to the capital markets is very expensive. And then at the same time, for these smaller companies, there is First North, yes. where the criteria are not actually that high, and the cost as well is not so high. And many of the companies that have went this way, they actually say that they seem to be getting all the benefits of the public market, even staying in the first north rather than going to the official market, you know, the official list. So is this something that is potentially encouraging for, for Latvian companies to, to actually consider? Uh, so uh, the first thing is that um, when uh, coming to the first north and when coming in general uh, to the market, uh, uh, we are typically saying it's expensive and there are a lot of costs. And uh, uh, the good things, uh, again, uh, uh, from the European Commission, we have the program that uh, uh, about half of the costs could be, uh, uh, could be uh, uh, funded by the, uh, by the money from, from Europe. And uh, this program is, uh, is going to be present till 2029, so that the companies, when they're raising funds, they could, uh, they could cover some of their, their costs. Uh, the first north, um, otherwise, uh, is a very good alternative, and we have seen that it, it's working. Uh, and uh, moreover, that um, if I look, uh, uh, let's say, at, at the companies uh, in uh, 101 list, uh, so how many companies uh, are present, which are on the top, and which could uh, potentially come to the market, uh, then uh, uh, then it's uh, very interesting that first first companies are almost uh, all the state-owned or, uh, or the internationally owned, then we have Virshet place number 69. Uh, so that, and we have uh, plenty of other companies which are above uh, this uh, place 69, which could come to the market and which could perfectly classify for the first North. And uh, the, the, the names I will not mention, but uh, quite, quite good companies. So uh, yes, the alternative is there. The fees uh, are quite uh, doable and uh, and uh, also, when uh, I was making a survey to the companies uh, in 2017 and 2023, and I was asking uh, the listed companies, so what is, uh, the, what is the most important for them to come to the market? So, and uh, if you look what was among their answers or what was the top answers, uh, we would expect that uh, listing fees or the cost to come to the market, they were not among the top questions, for example. So the reputation the company gets and the long-term financing was mentioned. So Yeah. Um, and IPOs are, are one of the exit routes as well. And we have uh, a generation who started businesses 30 years or so. And uh, not all of them are able to pass this to the next generation. So they, they have to uh, uh, get out of that, either by IPO or M&A deals. Um, and that's, uh, that doesn't seem to be really like an influencing factor quite a lot. We see 
those IPOs that are done here for, for different reasons, actually, right? Uh, the investors still like more the stories that uh, what was mentioned by Agnes, that we are going to invest somewhere. We need the money for some reason. So that's, uh, I, would not, uh, I would not reply for all the investors, but still the stories where we have a very certain strategy what we're going to do with the money. So this is what the investors that's, still prefer. That, that's a better story to, yeah. to, to go. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mari says you are alumni, so I can understand I can ask only provocative questions to you. Sure. So, um, as um, as a main investor is uh, is equity fund uh, in Ecobaltia. So, are you looking into IPO as well? You know, first of all, I must say that uh, we already paid for this school many years ago. Yes. Yeah? So we tried dual listing by the way. So we have tried almost everything by the way. For like good cognac, I can give the lesson personally. Uh, so uh, our uh, lesson was very simple. So previously we tried this in, in Latvia, I think it was 2013, a dual listing in Warsaw because Latvian stock exchange was really poor. Uh, so our estimate was that we were uh, around enterprise value, I think 30 million at that time. So we were trying to raise 10 new million and uh, do some uh, exit at the same time of a fund that we had inside. Uh, so the basic conclusion was very simple. Uh, we did not see much interest from uh, private persons, like zero. And then we saw some interest from uh, pension funds, but at the end we simply, when the, when the book was uh, filling up, decided uh, to save this and write off the few hundred thousand euros for the education purposes. So uh, then we managed to attract EBRD, which is one of the top investors in the region. Uh, substantially improve corporate governance. Uh, so last year we uh, did two bond issues. And again, this answered to me a couple of questions. So when I see who are the subscribers, yes, and luckily I have the chance to see who are subscribing before they get the allocation. Uh, so unfortunately I must say that there is really few Latvians, yes. And uh, of course then suddenly I had this chance to, to open uh, some, I don't know, it was Forbes or one of those famous magazines where there was like top 100 uh, most influential people or wealthy people in, in Baltics. I had really hard time to find Latvians. Honestly, I did not have enough time to find this one or two Latvians that were listed, yes. So eventually, it kind of uh, underlines the story. Listing in Latvia, 4% from GDP. Simply, we don't have this uh, nicer culture of accumulating. And also, from entrepreneurial perspective, once you are slightly bigger than average, so. There's a lot of interest from all different state institutions, yes? Uh, so what exactly are you doing? How come that you are wealthy, yes? So I think in Latvia, this is a big problem. Trust me, I have been in nearly all possible uh, institutions in Latvia where the handle on the door is only from outside, yes? And, uh, and just like, uh, it's nice to be there for a couple of hours interviews, but uh, it doesn't help business at all. That's one uh, thing. Uh, talking about exit right now, yes, I think Latvian stock exchange with everything I mentioned is probably suitable as an exit route, uh, even not exit route, as a listing route for mid-cap companies, yes, below 100 million euros, maybe. Uh, above that, I really doubt, so guys, wish you luck, but f don't forget uh, to pay for the school, always you need to do that. <laughs> uh, why I'm saying this is very simple, because uh, uh, if you think that this is an exit route, I haven't seen investor who really likes to let somebody exit uh, through that. So normally you first of all kind of attract uh, some funds for strategy, build nice info memos and so on, uh, or prospects, and then you try to exit after a one year lockup period probably, yes. And, and then there are probably some over-the-counter deals with, uh, with some already funds or secondary uh, market participants. Uh, what is the real problem is that actually, as you mentioned, uh, this people uh, aging and uh, passing the company to somebody else, uh, you know, we are buying a lot of companies in Baltics. And uh, my understanding for those guys who are now aging, it's in most cases, these companies are very poorly managed with really bad corporate governance. And trust me, uh, I thought I'm a real bastard as a manager, yes, but unfortunately most of my elderly friends are even worse than me, yes. And, uh, and this reflects both in corporate governance and the attitude towards uh, team, employees, uh, company culture. And it's really hard to sell uh, companies uh, which are authoritarily managed and the strategy is just uh, prepared and, and uh, decided by one person. Yeah, so we have worked really hard to implement real corporate governance and 
even if I wouldn't come to the work like for one or two months, nothing would change. There is real team which can do the job, yes. And I think this is a lacking for most of the companies that are entering this stage uh, where the, the old shareholders are somewhat aging and, and want to leave or pass the company somewhere else, yes. Right, and uh, so another bold question. So, so you have a, a private equity as an investor. Are they the ones that are pushing you to, to, to grow and do acquisitions? Well, uh, uh, yes, and uh, trust me, having private equity, especially uh, in Valda, is very comfortable. So maybe it was really uncomfortable first six months, because suddenly you have to work much more and nobody pays <laughs> over time. <laughs> but uh, again, uh, it's completely different thinking. So uh, like M&A has become integral part of our development strategy. and. Uh, we have established the investment department, which consists of quite many SSE graduates, and uh, and we are doing a lot of transactions and, uh, and following a lot of companies. And uh, if we are closing two, so probably we are doing like 10 deals over the year, uh, where we don't close eight of them, yes. Uh, and is IPO exit for us? Very unlikely at this stage, I, I would say. Why? Because I don't see this liquidity as if we are selling uh, to the next uh, stage investors who are maybe more uh, infra type of investors or global PE funds. So they again have this ambition to grow and trust me, Latvia and, and Baltics in general, despite the presence of Russia just a few hundred uh, kilometers away, we are the region with still double digit growth opportunities, especially in our sector where uh, this uh, green uh, philosophy is just now entering the market through taxonomy issues, through different uh, government in initiatives. And uh, for us, it's of course great opportunity because we can buy those companies that, uh, I don't know, they don't have strategy, they are tired, uh, somebody wants to exit. So everything that's available in the market is on our list and even those that are not available, so we are following them. Yeah. So if I summarize uh, your perspective on IPO or on, on, on equity on equity markets quite uh, pessimistic and not relevant and uh, capital markets still interesting for for bonds to finance to finance uh, acquisitions uh, yes I'm actually a fan of bonds uh, because I think at current the interest rates uh, like doing bonds at uh, fixed uh, fixed rate for next five years uh, or three years quite an interesting story to start developing the markets because through that we also create uh, interest uh, in uh, in private persons and I have seen actually a number of private persons coming into the markets uh, calling me being interested and then signing up. Uh, and also it's uh, education of the market that actually instead of just keeping your money in the bank account and getting your, I don't know, 2-3%, there's an option to, to buy bonds. So I would say that the first thing we have to do as a nation, we have to substantially increase the understanding about uh, what is capital markets about. And uh, I was uh, recently in uh, one famous bank, uh, Friday morning uh, breakfast, and the main problem, what uh, Zygur said, was that uh, they are mostly investing in U.S. stocks. Yes, so <laughs> uh, I remember when we were trying this bond, why we, uh, this um, IPO, why we went to Poland. It was uh, Warsaw had a very interesting uh, moment in there. So basically, the pension funds in Warsaw in those years were allowed to invest only in stocks listed in Warsaw, like stock exchange. So that was our bet uh, that maybe we'll be successful, yes. But unfortunately, we weren't. So it was kind of interesting uh, conclusion for us. But I think generally the main issue that those pension funds that we are creating, and uh, there are billions of pension money accumulating in the accounts, yes it somehow has to go also back to the Latvian market. Because right now, honestly, yes, I have stock investments in Latvia, definitely, but uh, I was simply too lazy to buy and follow many stocks, uh, despite a really good coverage by a bank, so we just bought, you know, US 500, do nothing, 15% uh, last 10 years. Uh, of course, a little bit depends when you invest, but generally speaking, that's the problem, that in Latvia, if you buy a stock of Irshi, so your best income is uh, coffee, 30% off. I have recovered all the investment, by the way, on this one. Yeah, I, th I think they have good uh, shareholder benefits, indeed, yeah. So I hope so. Air Baltic will follow the same route, so I'm <laughs> waiting for it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so moving to M&A uh, topic, so uh, I think uh, over the last 10 years we have been uh, pretty convinced and telling everybody that it's, uh, it's a good investment climate we have here, although small and uh, fragmented markets, but they are sort of crying for consolidation and, um, and there is tech innovation here, so it's 
not everything is sort of hopeless. And uh, and I also know many people are are, are quite busy with with ad at least advising on deals and being considered. But at the same time, all three markets are very small. Um, each has own language, um, legal differences, uh, le framework, legal framework, different um, financial depths of uh, of the markets is not really there to to finance large domestic or or um, acquisitions abroad. So. Financing certainly is is something that we always think about when uh, when funding uh, funding the deals. Uh, gloves with with your hat uh, uh, representing TET. Uh, at least I haven't heard that TET has been very active uh, acquiring something something notice noticeable over the last five years. Is that so? And uh, why is that? Are there not attractive growth opportunities or, or something else? Um, for the I mean, that's a specific uh, kind of situation because, I mean, they are now mostly kind of uh, the company with almost no debt and they're kind of generating uh, cash flows, steady cash flows for the shareholders. Of course, we we have a different issue. I mean, that's uh, the declining technologies uh, uh, in future kind of... Uh, uh, influence the the amounts and the turnovers, uh, but and uh, for us, I mean, some sizable, uh, scalable uh, investment. Uh, there are not not so much companies here. I mean, uh, of course, we can look on on, on some local uh, smaller uh, cable operators uh, or, or 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 companies who is kind of taking some part of the market share. But uh, uh, I would uh, I would say that. Uh, 80% of these uh, small companies, they are uh, building illegal uh, ducts and networks and uh, just from our corporate kind of governance point of view, we cannot acquire them because, I mean, all of their networks are almost illegal and uh, and we cannot do much about this because, I mean, nobody, even if that's in uh, law, that uh, you cannot build this over the roof uh, networks, nobody cares here. And, uh, and, 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 and for us, for example, I mean, uh, entered the competi com competition where, I mean, for us to build like one kilometer of fiber optics costs like, I don't know, 10,000, for them it costs like uh, 500 euro. And, and, and that, of course, changes kind of perspective. Of course, there is a second part, which is uh, entertainment and TV business. Of course, there we have a one big competitor, TV3 group, and of course, we need kind of to upgrade and invest in technologies kind of to compete and take that market. Uh, but there, either there is not so much kind of uh, uh, attractive uh, subjects because it needs quite uh, capital intensive, a lot of investments and not, not, not the small companies just cannot afford that. And uh, we, we would love kind of to buy uh, and to see the investment opportunities in, uh, in the local market, but uh, basically we need to do our own investments because I mean that's a scale that's a cheaper money and uh, no enough targets to uh, look after right and and going abroad is uh, is not an agenda because of who the shareholders are or yeah that, that's of course uh, the tricky because I mean one of the shareholders they are already in uh, in uh, Lithuania and Estonia and also Scandinavia of course we are doing uh, some uh, expansion a little bit in Ukraine where we have some quite a lot of data center clients but I mean that's our almost kind of a, a very small local presence in Ukraine and most of the clients are scoring uh, storing uh, that uh, here in, in in Latvia as a kind of backup uh, emergency service and that business is growing steadily every year and uh, but but that business also it's very capital intensive I mean uh, new data center costs like uh, 30, 40 mil, and uh, with with no debt and strong balance sheet, that's not really uh, an obstacle, is it? Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, of course. I mean, uh, there are uh, some. We are trying to use some EU funding for that purpose and so on. But uh, yes, uh, for now, that's not a problem for Tet. I mean, to, to invest that. But I mean, uh, uh, now we we get a much cheaper money in the banks if needed, rather than bonds. But of course. For 
from a global, more global perspective, I mean, uh, I, I would strongly kind of advocate and all the time telling to the or main shareholder, which is a state that uh, consolidating the telecom assets in Latvia, that's already I mean, needed to be done like 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, we're just kind of uh, cutting, uh, uh, losing money every day by not doing that uh, from a state perspective, but I mean, creating one... Uh, so, so it's again a uh, lack of brave decisions? Uh, definitely. I would say that, uh, that this uh, merger should be happening, I don't know, it was 17, uh, the last attempt, I mean, uh, and that company, of course, would be more attractive uh, as a stable cash flow uh, dividend generator for investors, uh, like a real estate, you, I mean, you can probably list uh, around 20, 30 percent, uh, and st still kind of state could be the shareholders, and Natalia could be shareholders, and the public could be share so, shareholders. So it sounds that the generation change is not happening among politicians. <sighs> well, that's, uh, I mean, uh, there are certain kind of... Uh, always certain excuses why this is not a good time to do that. Yeah. And uh, that's already for, I don't know, 10 years or more. Got this, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the f former politician can, uh, can tell, I don't know, usually, I mean, uh, that all the assets are owned by different ministries. Normally, then after the new elections, uh, every ministry is a different party, and uh, which always fights among themselves, and that they can never kind of can come up, say, uh, with a brave decision, let's put it together, let's make extra 10 million in dividends every year from the merging these businesses, just not spending, uh, avoiding double costs and so on. But, but uh, right. you can. I, I mean, that's easy win, but I don't understand why, why this cannot be done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, Agnes, so let, let, let me exploit uh, sort of your freshness in, uh, in municipality-owned uh, company. Do you think that a uh, municipality-owned company could do acquisition ever? And let's say uh, uh, Riga Water uh, could own uh, a water company somewhere else in, a, in another city? I would say not in another city, but uh, there is more interesting uh, that uh, it acquisi acquisition could be considered on surrounding territories. Uh, currently, Riga Water Company provides services to Jakava, Ruopaši, Jurmala, Marupe. Uh, we have up-to-date production processes, and especially in this time when this uh, upcoming large uh, capital investments for all these uh, players are on, on the table, and not everyone can afford it. Yeah. Uh, therefore, also Europe experience shows that the companies in our industry work uh, in a uh, uh, bigger area, and it brings positive effect on efficiency and lower cost to customers, actually. Therefore, I would say that all these factors could be considered, and taking account also a benefit uh, for residents. But I'm not sure that there will be brave, there will be brave decisions uh, soon. <laughs> so, so what 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 is missing? Um, all these companies are owned by municipality com uh, municipalities. <laughs> okay. Um, Johan, turning to you on uh, sort of funding M and A deals. Uh, so many of them uh, happen rel relatively quickly. I don't dare to say that they can happen quickly, uh, although expectations sometimes are. Do you see a lot of uh, local Baltic players coming to you to finance m and deals? And what's your typical um, sort of process and how you look at these? Are these, are these risky deals uh, taking time or, or good deals? I would say, I mean, I think the activity, there is activity there, um, but um, yeah, it's not, I mean, the, differ the main difference between, I think, the Baltics, uh, and I'm not sort of talking all three countries and, and more, let's say, developed states, is the presence of real PE uh, players. I mean, you have one or two maybe in the Baltics, uh, but that's it. Uh, and normally those are the ones who drive a lot of the M&A agenda. Uh, but, but I mean, here, so if you take a traditional company, they usually never do a deal quick. They do it, I mean, maybe except for Ecobalti and a few others, because you now 
have sort of institutionalized your M&A track. Most companies, it's a once in a lifetime, you know, it's a huge thing. It's uh, big for the owners. So the quick, the sort of the speed uh, is usually not an issue. It's usually that in the end, uh, both for the seller and the buyer, it's a huge step. And, and this, this market is not, ju it's not there mentally because a lot of people are too afraid for that step. Uh, I mean, we've done two acquisitions ourselves. Uh, one was, was with Unicredit because they were exiting. Uh, and then we did, uh, we bought the portfolio or actually bought a couple of portfolios. But, but I mean, uh, I think there's great opportunities on the M&A market, but I mean, there also needs to be a purpose to do a or, or an acquisition. You just don't do it because, it, well, well, you have leaders who do it because they want to boost their ego, but that's the wrong incentive. Uh, you should do it for the right fundamentals. Um, so, so I don't think financing is an issue, to be honest. Uh, I think financing becomes an issue when Baltic companies acquire outside the Baltics, because that's out of the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Baltic companies acquiring in the Baltics, no problem. And we also spoken to a couple of sponsors, unfortunately, Less so now because of geopolitics, but before, where basically uh, international funds were looking to acquire into the Baltics. And there we can also support, but then usually they have their international network of banks, so they don't even talk to the local banks. Um, so I think that's, that's the situation. And, and uh, yeah, I, I fundamentally, I don't think M&A is an issue in this market. I think the bigger issue is on a macro level, and it's around the maturity to think about capital markets and investments uh, from private perspective, but also from institutional perspective. Because that's where, the, I mean, it kind of starts with that there needs to be money that is ready to invest. Right. Uh, at the same time, so some of those uh, bond issuers who go to capital markets, they, they say that they want to diversify their financing sources. And... Um, from your perspective, sort of loan versus bond when they come, do they? Do you consider that some of these um, these players are are maybe not sufficiently experienced, and the deal itself is risky, or the collateral will not be there? What's your sort of no, bank, I mean, banker's perspective? Yeah, I, on I this? think from from a bank's perspective, we like all sources of funding, right? We we. We like the market to be uh, active. We want the companies to diversify the funding. It's not like I don't like, I mean, I like bond funding as well. It's just that I don't get it on my balance sheet. Well, actually, we have supported some clients by investing in their bond as relationship lending. I mean, if you look at international markets, you have the full spectra of, of uh, funding sources, starting from, you know, uh, equity and then ranging all the way down to senior senior secured funding. So, so I think that's what needs to happen here as well. And it's a good thing that the bond market has sort of picked up. Uh, but, but I think again, um, the general society, and I think it starts to a great extent with the state and the pension system, has to support this. And today, you, for example, if you're a local bond invest, bond issuer in this market. There's no way the pension funds can invest because there's no secondary market and usually the tickets are too small. So then what you need to do? Well, then you need maybe to create an alternative investment fund. So who's going to do that? We'll see. Uh, and, and then you can sort of bundle it and you can do stuff. But that needs to happen for equity market. It needs to happen for every source. And then you need to get, uh, you know, then you need to get the, the common... The, let's say the common population needs to be exposed to the capital markets because that's, in the end, even if you just have one euro saving, you're much better off in putting it into capital markets because, you know, we are, as a bank, we will never pay that. We, we don't take, I mean, you don't take risk when you put it in the bank. That's why you don't get that reward. Simple as that. Yes. But that's how you build the wealth in the country. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Maris was... Uh, increased uh, interest rates and uh, leverage being uh, an important uh, factor in, uh, in M&A activity, has cost of capital, sort of increased cost of capital, stopped you doing some deals or, or phasing out something or delaying something? Uh, it's a very good question. First of all, I think the main question is why we are doing m and yes. uh, and. Uh, I would say this primary question of what we want to achieve. So in our case, uh, 
I kind of understood for myself that basically we are doing this because we want to consolidate market. We want to create like a platform investment, which is not 100 million enterprise value, but much more. So that when we are doing exit, we can approach the next level investors. Because when you think about what you are doing in your life, what you want to achieve, the question is who is the ultimate buyer after three or five or 10 years? Yes. And unfortunately, in Latvia, it's very simple. There are more or less three uh, PE funds. And since the largest PE fund is already our investor, so we eventually come to the fact that uh, it's well, very unlikely that our buyer will be from this region. Which means that uh, we are doing this uh, M&A uh, because of a number of issues. And the main issue is to build enterprise value so that, uh, and also market presence so that we become interesting uh, target for uh, funds well outside uh, the Baltic region, yes. Uh, in that context, of course, money is just a resource, yes. And uh, uh, as Johan said, in our case, so we have uh, structured this investment process to very structured manner with investment comms, uh, case presentations, and so on, which uh, in no way, like, money is not an issue. So sometimes I even have this joke with my CFO that maybe we are just, you know, from then, a psycho house because uh, normally we'd have maybe 10 million in the account and the normal agenda item is you know 40 mil deal uh, with expected closing uh, within a half year and i think in in our experience most likely the most interesting part was our uh, recent transaction in poland which we closed uh, so we managed to streamline the rising of funds on the bond market uh, getting some money from the polish bank as Latvian banks were not eager to fund the, the, this transaction, yes. And then at the end, also attracting uh, our uh, our shareholders as partners. So we managed to conclude this transaction and acquire the largest P PVC recycler in Poland, yes. And I think it's a bit of a, of course, uh, I don't know how to say exactly how much resource uh, it took uh, from the team, yes, but we managed to do it. and. Uh, is uh, is uh, so interest rates? I'm not sure. So if you so how many of you are with CFO background? Let me ask the question. So one person. Okay, one person. Not bad. So uh, basically, it means you have to have this uh, your long-term financing strategy. Yes, and uh, if you know what is DSCR, so you know what are the covenants banks are asking. So basically, you provide a mix of funding uh, with the concept that you are meeting bank covenants uh, and. The financing structure means you uh, meet your cash flow uh, forecast. Yes? Because if you are uh, funding all your transactions in the bank, which is maybe cheaper, one problem is that uh, sort of if your uh, I don't know product has go to market market expectation in two years and the bank is giving one year grace period, so very simple question: what you are going to do in the second year of your uh, uh, product product or whatever I don't know transaction development and so on. So uh, in our case, so we are uh, looking for uh, funding that meets uh, our uh, forecasts regarding the uh, investments we are doing, either it's organic or, or m and And uh, with respect to interest rates, so it influences, uh, so we are in, in SSE. So when I was studying here, like interest rates were part of the pricing models, yes. Probably is it also today. So it simply influences the price. So if the interest rate is high, so the price is lower, most likely. Simple as that. And for this transaction, you used also uh, Polish bank financing as well. So what's your experience with Polish Polish banks compared to, to Latvian? It's oh, a very good question, yes. My problem probably is the fact that I never met this Polish bank because we have 2,500 employees reporting. Uh, so, uh, but uh, yes, uh, it is a bit... Um, uh, any uh, any transborder uh, transaction, I would say, it, it's a, is of transformational nature. Because uh, it, uh, first of all, different culture, yes. All this uh, way we are used to Latvian banks, uh, I don't know, Friday agree on terms, on Monday ready to sign, yes, in Poland this does not work. Uh, then there is this lot of Euro question, uh, then there are different uh, set of covenants they are looking at, uh, but I don't see big differences, yes. So maybe pricing a little bit different, again, uh, is it Polish or Euro-based loans, yes, how to... Uh, how to mitigate your uh, exchange uh, rate risk. So otherwise, uh, we are doing very structured approach. So when we do transactions, so we just go to top five banks, uh, do a case presentation and ask for funding a number of times also asking for Citadel, yes. 
and and so on. And uh, this is good uh, good uh, training for the team because you get good feedback, good questions. So if you can't answer those questions uh, while raising funding, so probably there is a mistake in the model or somewhere. And the same applies also for Poland. So I think in Poland our experience was that uh, at the end of the day it came down to two or I think three offers which we got. Two of them were uh, more realistic, so we ended up with uh, with one, uh, which we chose and, and closed. So I think all things considered, I would say it was uh, quite a challenging transaction, but we still made it on time because it was all about deadlines. Okay. Uh, Natalia, sort of... Uh we living very close to the to the war zone, uh, uh, and this suddenly impacts the view of investors about the risk risk premium they attach to the to the markets, their views on on riskiness as such, and um, discount rates that are that that are used. Do you think that's also a factor impacting uh, M and A activity in the Baltics over the last couple of years? Yeah, so in the financial markets, we have the fundamental rules. We already mentioned uh, the discounting. And uh, uh, so the uh, higher the risk, the higher returns. There is why the, definitely the investors would assume the uh, higher returns from the region, the more risk we have here. But uh, I always believe that there is a supply and demand. We are in the market. So if for somebody, this is uh, a risk appetite. Sorry, for, for, for the risk appetite of one fund, it's too much. There will be another fund coming. But uh, I think the good... Uh, lesson we could, uh, could learn from what has happened in Ukraine, Ukraine. because uh, Kiev School of Economics had made a study on the M&A transactions in the period of 2000 to, till 2003, uh, with a special focus on 2022, which was uh, the um, uh, year we know. So, and uh, their takeaway was that uh, during 2022, the number of M&A deals shrank, shrank uh, a lot, but uh, the most important is that the domestic investors were still doing, making those deals. So, and I think this is the takeaway we can take for the local market, so that in case of uh, increasing risks, who always will behave as domestic investors, there is why uh, both for the uh, capital markets, for the IPOs, for the M&A, we should care about the Baltic investors. And uh, it's never a, a quick exercise. So it's always an investment market. It's always when you need to develop the investors. So it's never in a year or in a two. So yeah, there is why the market is still there. The, uh, the, uh, the deals are still taking place. But who is the buyer? Who, who, who will end up in the, uh, if, if something goes wrong? So yeah, domestic investors. Yeah. I, think, I think we see regional investors being much more active and maybe because others are just not there so much as, as they used to be, but they certainly seem to, to fill, the, fill the gap in, in, in some way. Okay. Uh, Can I add to this conversation a little bit? Sure, sure. <laughs> I think one big problem is simply the scale of the companies. Uh, so if you look at uh, what Klaus also mentioned, that in Latvia, uh, realistically, there are not so many companies which would be interesting uh, and considered as targets for, let's say, sizable European funds. Uh, we need companies with hundreds of millions of capitalization to, to see, I don't know, companies like Blackstone investing here a lot or Maguire or whatever funds we are uh, talking about. Yes. The problem is that uh, Latvia specifically somehow has these mid-cap companies which are then later bought by Estonians or Lithuanians. Then they do some regional transformation. The question is why not Latvians? Yeah. Yes, and yeah. sell to somebody else. And we Latvians continue, I don't know, plowing the ground in the countries. <laughs> But, but I think, you know, yeah, I, I agree with that, but then I think also the region as such. I mean, if you look at what's happened over the last 15 years, okay, financial crisis, it hits the worst in the Baltics out of Europe, okay, that scares away investors, okay? Yeah, and Latvia specifically. Then you have a, you know, a number of uh, explosions around AML, scares away investors again, right? And then you have the war in Ukraine, which is not, has nothing to do with the region. It's just the fact that we are in proximity. And I mean, the big investors, they have, a, I mean, this is not about discount rates. They basically say, either we can invest or we cannot. And most of them, it's such easy, much easier to say, we cannot invest, because it's much simpler. It makes our life simpler, it's off the chart. And then, it's, and then if you decide to invest, then you have the size issue. So it's like a couple of hurdles you need to get over. But I think foreign direct investment should be very high in the agenda because that's the only way that's going to stimulate in the long run. I mean, you can bring out local capital, but you need the foreign direct investments because otherwise, 
it will, you know, the, you will never get the growth going. And, and eventually you will also get talent to leave the country. Because talent is needed to keep these companies, but also to attract the foreign direct investments. Yeah. And that would suggest that the governments and politicians would be thinking about everything that attracts FDI is, is key. Yeah. And sometimes we see they, they don't really do that. So any, any Can other remarks? also to this one? Uh, no, yes. I think the main problem that the politicians we have in this country, maybe except Gat Seglitz, is <laughs> I'm not sure they really understand what's happening out there. That's the main problem, because I have this uh, hobby to meet them once in a while and then listen to, to their sayings, and I think they're far, very from, far from real world, so. Yeah. Any, any uh, other remarks, sort of uh, maybe preemptive measures before we get those questions that might be not so, uh, not so polite and nice and, and, and quite challenging, so anybody wants to add anything? To, let's, to, let's, go let, let's go for questions. So, so I see the audience has been uh, very, very patient with opportunity to, to, to ask questions. So, so now is the time, and then, uh, and then uh, after these questions, then we will conclude with some uh, crystal ball section of, of, of this discussion. So, any volunteers? Yes. No, it's fine. We, 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 we hope it's trust, and I will, I will probably. Uh, repeat your question, so to give extra time to, to think answers. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be a bit through there. We have three questions, two big ones and then one. Pick the best one. Uh, the best one is the small one, but okay. Firstly, compliments to Marx about not coming to work and nothing changing, uh, but on a more serious note, uh, compliments to uh, Natalia about bringing up the size of the bond market. So let me summarize. What are key reasons why bond market is more active than equity market? Let's go in queue. Yeah. Okay. I, I could start. So as uh, uh, as the person who was uh, doing the uh, first uh, sovereign issue of Latvenergo, I could of course say that uh, in bond market we have the state-owned company and the equity market and the equity market we do not have. But... Um, uh, being uh, an answering uh, answering to your question, so first of all, the uh, preparation period for any company coming to the bond market is much shorter than uh, than for the equity market. And to give you a perspective, uh, for the bond market, if uh, uh, many things are aligned in the company, you could start in half a year, one year. Then for the for an IPO, you cannot physically prepare quicker than one year. Two years, so it's it's a long time period, and uh, uh, the companies I was meeting in uh, uh, 2015, 2014, wh wh which were planning to go in for an IPO in the coming years, they're still in the process of preparation. So that, uh, yeah. So the bond market is uh, very often as the good uh, market to see what is the sentiment of the of. Uh, as uh, the, it was mentioned, that uh, as, as a test market, so what is the sentiment of the investor? So there is why the bond market is easier, maybe also for uh, from the perspective of the pension funds, they have uh, more mandate to to uh, to buy the bonds. Uh, many factors, actually. Yeah, so I think I've mentioned, uh, Mari. To add? Uh, yes, I can add maybe a little bit from investor perspective. Yes. Uh, so I was checking uh, recently. So uh, what shares I have bought, besides the fact that uh, Indexo was falling and I just used this opportunity. Uh, on the rest of the shares I have bought, I think this growth is almost zero, except that uh, they are dividend paying or they offer this free coffee. Yes. And uh, on the bond market, again, if you are so, uh, let's say, lazy, you don't want to go to buy this Virshi coffee in Tarbot Street, so you can simply invest for this 10 12, 13 percent, yes, which is not a bad deal. 
and uh, to go out and make I don't know 13 percent on uh, on whatever investment it's actually I assume, quite assuming a they pay uh, in yes, the end yes. as well yes yes of course it's a question who is the last guy there always. but let's assume that everybody pays let's just assume <laughs> uh, and if you are uh, even uh, super lazy to decide who will not pay you can go to capital by the way who is doing this uh, some sort of bond uh, fund yes so and they are also quite actively signing up for those uh, bond issues so i think there are at least i see good options if you are uh, like average investor and you don't want to uh, do a lot of risk so and you are very, very kind of patriotic, do not want to invest in this US 500 because you don't know where it is. So you go to Capital, uh, meet Juris Grishins, by the way, my schoolmate also graduated from this, uh, from this brilliant school. And I think he's doing a good job. So you can invest your 100,000 euros, he will compile a few investors and do this. So. Uh, no investment advice shared today. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. I mean, I, I think it's also about like this you know, success creates success. So if somebody starts something, if we would have the same trajectory on the bond market as we have on the, equi uh, on the equity market as we have on bond, you would sit there and ask, why don't we have more bonds? So I think that is one thing. And it kind of, it reduces the drama because you know my neighbor invested in a bond. So why can I not do it, right? So that's one thing. And then I think also just being a bit mindful about, I mean, not stereotyping, but there is, there is a level of risk averseness in Latvians. And bond kind of fits that probably better than equity. Whereas I think the Estonians, they're much ready to take more risk. And equity market then fits. But it's also a little bit chicken the egg. So I think that we could see the same effect in equity market, but you need to have five, six, seven successful cases where you don't say, as Maris, I'm pretty much net zero. I am plus 200%, and then it creates a vibe. So that's sort of, it's circumstances, but that's what needs to happen. Uh, just one uh, comment, maybe. If you are following the stock exchange, you probably have noticed that uh, the Estonian equity market is uh, delivering better returns, yes. And this also somehow makes this feeling about markets that, you know, if you go to Estonia and meet people, they are much more keen to invest in. Uh, equities and bonds and do some balanced portfolios in Latvia, I somehow don't feel this vibe, even uh, among my friends who are quite uh, okay in the money. Yeah? So I don't feel this vibe, you know, let's do... This agriculture of, uh, mentality is not yes, there. Yes, yes, a little bit. Let's buy forest. I like this. I'm also <laughs> buying forest because if I have nothing to do, the forest is still growing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I would say that Natalia already covered at the time is uh, is uh, one of the topic in our case, and uh, and as well as that there is uh, experience in bond market, Latvian Ergo, for example, and it's quite easy decision for the for municipality owned companies. I mean, just to shortly, I mean, uh, from discussions with investment banks, both from the bond perspective and from my PO perspective, I mean, they claim that these are different type of the investors who invest in bonds and who invest in equity. And the, but the gentleman mentioned probably that li liquidity probably is one why the bond is still with a certain maturity, uh, certain coupon uh, people understand. Equity is kind of you don't know when uh, you will be able to exit that and uh, that of course uh, no liquidity and the people just uh, afraid of uh, that investment and uh, I, I guess that's uh, if you have a bigger market more transactions and that's uh, is driving uh, prices and uh, more deals and uh, makes the equity more attractive yeah. okay um, over there So, to, to whom are you addressing this question? To the panel. To the panel. <laughs> so, so what's any takers? Who, so, what's done on regulatory front to uh, sort of to ease up these things? I would not be an expert. I mean, uh, maybe Lien. Uh, from the Nasdaq point of view, could take this question because I mean, she's probably more involved in uh, this regulatory uh, changes uh, rather than. Uh yeah, I, I can jump in. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so of course the size is, is the problem and that's why uh, a lot of years ago we have created this pan-Baltic market. So we are like expecting that investors look at us, the Baltic regional market fully integrated from the investor's perspective, it is really so because it's the same trading system, same uh, trading uh, platforms and, and, and rules and everything. So from that perspective, it's kind of, we, we have tried to, to, to look bigger and be bigger. So that, that is one part, but now just recently, uh, also we have managed to convince our governments that, that this is the, the, the moment and, and, and this really, we are special with, with this Baltic integration because we are the only uh, European market, which is integrated in, in the way we are. And our governments, uh, all three Baltic countries' governments now are working on the new uh, regulation in regards to the uh, documents submitted by the, by the listed companies to, to, to become listed. So there will be uh, harmonized requirements, harmonized uh, like templates, or let's, let's call them so. Uh, so until then, there were like different, three different, different uh, kind of rules and, and list of things to be included. And investment bankers were complaining, "Come on, we are making pan Baltic offering, and, and we are struggling with this because each regulator is like expecting something a little different." Now this will be solved. So this is just one example how like we are continuing to, to work towards this pan-Baltic uh, pan -Baltic markets to, to make it easier for an investor to uh, approach us and uh, access us. So. Thank you. But if, if I may, I mean, regulatory, I agree with all, all that was said, but I think what is important also is to incentivize the investors, right? If you look at the pension system, there are no tax benefits. Okay, if you look at the way, if you invest, you have capital tax. There's no way you can get around that. Okay, many countries have, in, have introduced sort of a minimal fee investment accounts up to a certain limit. I mean, there are many of these, these things that you can do to incentivize, and it doesn't matter if it's equity or bonds. Uh, so that, I think, is lacking. Um, so basically, I think it's around taxonomy, and then it's about education, which is not regulatory as well, but again, if, I mean, I did my first equity trade when I was 11 or 10 years old, okay? Uh, I was part of the national equity, because I was reading the daily news, and in there that you can participate in national equity competition. I entered when I was 13, I came in 20th place. I think I made 1,500 euros as a prize money. But I mean, that opens up, you know, my, my daughter's friends, they're like 12 years old, they go around and trade crypto on their phones. I mean, it's a completely different society. So, so uh, that just comes through society. It doesn't come through regulation. It comes through education. I'm not saying that's only good. I don't think 12-year-olds should trade cryptos. But it's just different type of lifestyle. Um, so that's, I think that's where the government can do a lot together with business uh, community as well. OK, thank you. Um, uh, question. I'm a lawyer, so sorry for. Uh Primitive question. Uh, question to Johan. Uh, you mentioned a few good uh, reasons for not being a pioneer, uh, undeveloped infrastructure, maybe passive local uh, individual investors. Uh, the question if you would like to access Baltic market, why not go to Tallinn if it works? Why we actually all couldn't trade in uh, Tallinn? If we fly from Riga, why can't we trade from Tallinn? Um, well, we are good corporate citizens. And I think in the long run, we c we'd have definitely discussed if we should list ourselves in Tallinn. But again, being a headquartered Baltic bank in Latvia, I, I still hope and I wish that if we IPO, we would still do it through Riga. And in the end, it's not such a big difference because the offering will be Baltic wide. So any investor in Estonia would have the opportunity to invest. Uh, so. I don't think it's that sort of the listing as such is not the biggest issue, but obviously the investor base, if we would go local, would probably predominantly be a lot of Estonians uh, because they just have a different mentality and, and use in investing in, in, uh, in stocks from the retail side. Yeah, that's, that's what we see in yeah, yeah, absolutely. Previous, absolutely. Uh, previous issues. And also if you yeah. see Estonians, they try to go to 
let's say Lithuania and Latvia, but they pick up very little volume. Um, so, I mean, there is a pan-Baltic market, but the fact is, so far, Estonians has been the most active. Full stop. But it doesn't really matter about the listing, I would say. But maybe someone has a different view on this. Doesn't seem so. Yeah. Next question. Uh, the question starts with an opinion, which is maybe an obvious tone, but I, I think getting this, uh, this whole traction is, is largely about trailblazing. And it's been there out for ages. You know, that we need a good, proper, uh, nice, understandable state on company, put on exchange, whether Baltic is the most stable. Uh, company, I'm not uh, so sure, but in, in unstable industry, the most stable, yeah. In the most yeah. stable industry as well. Uh, but that's the narrative that's been around, uh, but it doesn't seem to be ever to be generally uh, assumed by politicians in the political rhetoric. So my question is, do you have maybe have on mind or, or maybe a suggestion uh, for politicians like maybe Gottes, who's here uh, and, and intends to win the next election? How could uh, uh, reviving the uh, public capital markets become or be phrased as a political narrative for somebody to win the election. Because currently what's happening, why we like the brave, brave, uh, brave uh, decisions is that politicians are afraid that will cost them political capital. So the question is how could we turn it around? So basically, yeah, how, how we talk to the pensioners, the sort of the biggest voting group, uh, just a kind of a short answer. Yeah, no, no, there was, no, no, I mean, there was like yesterday I saw some Bloomberg's uh, table with uh, the net worth of uh, Europeans in each country, and Latvia was scoring the uh, at the at the end, and I would say that this is electorate uh, with the, the politicians is dealing with, and, 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 and of course, I mean, in average, the students and next kind of leaders and business people here is we are only maybe only a few percent of that um, population who is voting, and of course, we should kind of address the pensioners in uh, different Lat regions in Latvia or, 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 or working class people uh, from which we all come, but I mean, uh, it's certain education or whatever, we are there where we are right now and we think we differently about investing and uh, what state should do and, and so on. But uh, I would say that uh, this opinion is so much different uh, from most of the uh, other kind of uh, electorate, this is why maybe it's not always working and it's so hard them to convince and win election only on uh, going uh, public uh, with whatever Latvian Ergo or, 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 or Red Baltic or, or somebody else. I mean, especially I guess this uh, state monopolies like Latvian Ergo and state forests are better you don't mention this because everyone will think that this is a stealing uh, some something as it happens I don't know in 90s where there was a privatization so uh, that's a killer for politicians but of course there are many companies like uh, Air Baltic or uh, LMT that whatever I mean who is competing in free market with uh, free competition and and, and in that opinion, I would think the, the the public markets will definitely add value to these companies rather than kind of... Uh, but I think that's a question whether that's really the case. I mean, I haven't heard that somebody has asked whether today views about private, privatizing Latvian Ergo, for example, would be the same as, as 10 years ago. So whether that's really the, the case. No, but I mean, uh, at least uh, when politicians kind of uh, mention this capital market, there is always coming out a lot of this uh, negative comments. I mean, uh, this will be stealing. It sounds like politicians yeah. have the best memory in, uh, in society. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's yeah. that may be true, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Klaus like covered uh, most of what I wanted to say, but I think first of all, any political initiatives on the capital market uh, or some major uh, listings won't uh, address significant uh, pool of voters. That's I think number one issue. But number two, what I think we come to the point where we should simply list like Latvenergo, La Telecom, LMT, uh, maybe even State Forest, because these are basically profit-making companies which are working in very stable environment. And for instance, in my portfolio, they would simply add into the stocks that are delivering dividends, and then I kind of feel more attached that even if there are some idiots uh, making decisions on higher electricity tariffs and, I don't know, half billion profit, so I'm still benefiting from that, yeah? so less problems. 
uh, because uh, we are kind of uh, now this gap between uh, ordinary people and politicians is so huge because I literally feel that they are stealing from my money when I hear this uh, Latin Energo profit because I don't know where it goes, yes, after they pay dividends. But yeah, if so, they so if we say, would be a rational society, we would be listing these companies. Yes, but, but and we I are would, not. I would probably also say that it's important that uh, there would be some initiative, as Klaus or Johan mentioned, that let's say, if you invest up to 50 or 100,000, you don't pay this income tax. Because I remember there were a couple of years ago some changes and you had to go from one type of accounts into some other. Then in the middle you had to exit the market, pay some tax, go back. So like, why? And if you are probably, I know for me it was just, okay, call the private bank, I'll solve it. But for an ordinary person, like, why should I do this and pay some tax in the middle of nowhere? And you don't so know. on state uh, state bonds, they have done this already. So it's pretty easy to buy. There's no uh, income tax. So and three percent or whatever they pay. Uh, three four percent, yeah. So. But, but I think there there is definitely opportunity to create something like that, and that I think would address quite substantial uh, pool of waters. Yeah. Uh, just to add uh, is that um, already we have uh, many discussions in the media about uh, state-owned companies being brought to the market. For me, it's also an opportunity that uh, they are more transparent, I understand what is happening, similar to Morris, but uh, the ones who are generating all this discussion are the uh, peer political parties. I'm sorry, so there is why this is, <laughs> this is not the uh, regular investors or, the, uh, or not the citizens, but the other political parties which, uh, which uh, want to create all this discussion. So another thing is that um, the state-owned companies, when brought to the market so already this this is happening already we have seen the similar situation 2017 so this is the second attempt let's see let's see how it goes another thing which is uh, uh, proposed uh, from the European Commission or European politicians is to change the taxation so and this is uh, also what uh, what was mentioned by Maris and uh, this uh, could uh, what uh, what uh, our voters uh, could like about it about the situation so let's make the lower taxes on the investments uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so th th those those are the two things which are which are there at the moment. Yeah, I think uh, just giving one share of Latvenergo to each uh, to each uh, inhabitant and getting dividends might really change the situation. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, any any other questions? Yes. Uh, I had a question. Um, uh, do you personally own any uh, Baltic stocks and bonds? I think Maris already partly uh, replied on that. that uh, yes or no? What were the considerations uh, and motivation from sort of your private, from the private investor uh, point of view? As much as you are free to share in a in an bigger audience, and you typically do this. Yeah. I'm a bond investor in uh, in the Baltic markets. Uh, in in. The bond investor, uh, unfortunately, not in Maris' company because I didn't like fixed coupon. Uh, I have his competitor's uh, cleaner bond, uh, which is kind of a Eurobor attached, uh, and the other one, uh, this alcohol company, uh, uh, the SPV, who is also uh, investor. So uh, I'm I'm investor through the bonds, yes, <laughs> and uh, basically the what Johan and uh, others mentioned. I mean, they are solid companies uh, in uh, with a stable cash flows, uh, uh, reasonably leveraged, uh, and um, basically this is kind of a good deal for uh, tenish uh, percent uh, on 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 investment. Uh, just to, I mean not to keep money i bought them when the interest rate still was kind of um, uh, just starting to grow so uh, yeah that's 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 reason i also use this uh, simple version sp500 uh, just not to name thing but if i had opportunity to invest in this water company and uh, with regular income uh, quite stable i would say uh, why not why I'm paying these tariffs? I will come back, uh, take back this uh, money through dividends. So yeah, I have I have exposure to the Baltics. Um, actually, one of my best investments. 
Um, but then I normally don't do stocks because I'm a lousy stock picker. The only time I did right was when I was 12 and participated <laughs> in this competition. <laughs> Since then, it's just been like losses. So I do fixed income, but I haven't done much fixed income in the Baltic. I've been looking at actually fixed income in the Baltics, but um, I uh, yeah, the, the problem is secondary markets are also really weak. So if you're not part of the primary, it's hard to get in. Uh, so I do fixed income, but mainly. Uh, yeah, outside the Baltics, where there's a secondary. Guess what? Once over beer, he suggested me to invest in one company where I made a lot of money. So, <laughs> so I will be more careful. But yes, as I said, uh, I have invested in uh, in shares, and uh, I think primarily because of some uh, really uh, sympathy that uh, we need to develop this market. And actually, in many times, those uh, those owners or managers, I, I know them personally, they have come uh, and we have discussed some things. And probably in the future, I'll invest more because uh, if not us, then who else? Yes, it's very unlikely that uh, grandmas will start investing in, in Citadel, actually. So. Yeah, so I'm a, a typical Latvian investor from the perspective that the majority of my funds are in the real estate. Uh, uh, but uh, I had uh, I have many points in in my life been a very very active uh, investor in stocks and bonds and different types of portfolios. At the moment, I have uh, exposure to S and P 500. Some part and some part is the Baltic exposure. I absolutely adore Madara from uh, from all the perspective. I have supported them. Uh, I have Virshi Enefit, so quite a typical uh, Latvian investor, so to say. Yeah, I, I also do Baltic in investment uh, so that there is no discrepancy discrepancy between what I t teach teach or preach and uh, what what I do, and uh, I also uh, have a special interest in in my own study on uh, on IPOs, what happens before, uh, what happens uh, afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Do we have yes? A question to Agnes. Uh, when we talk about uh, Riga Unas, we're talking about the monopoly, right? We have no competitors, and most Latvians, most Riga citizens don't go and buy Edina to watch themselves, or they don't go to Baudova to get a bus. Uh, so, uh, if you were to go to an IPO, how are you going to balance the shareholder rights and the common, what the common Riga inhabitant uh, wishes, because you are profiting of common Riga inhabitants, right? Yeah, actually, is that uh, shareholder rights uh, decision making will be still on uh, municipality. Uh, you can uh, just earn this money from dividends because currently we have set clear uh, profitability for next uh, years, and that's a uh, gain for the uh, residents. Over there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so last year the M and A market in the Baltics was rather slow. However, there were like. Uh, a couple of remarkable deals, uh, namely um, many, uh, at least a couple of uh, significant Nordic investors exiting real estate in the Baltics. For instance, a uh, huge uh, shopping mall in uh, Tallinn, also in Vilnius, and these were like the most remarkable deals, I would say. Uh, now we see that uh, uh, Blackstone Group is uh, exiting uh, Luminor, maybe there are some other banks. Uh, on sale in Baltics, perhaps. So why is that? Is there uh, maybe the Nordic investors' funds have expired? Maybe they need liquidity because their own, own economies are going down? Or what's the reason for that? Why, why are so they any, anybody ready to give sort of a uh, general answer to general question? <laughs> I'm personally quite an investor in real estate also in Latvia, but uh, I think for real estate mostly that's uh, the fund, fund maturities uh, and they usually these kind of uh, big properties, they flap uh, uh, to the, some other funds, uh, similar type, and uh, basically the investors just are uh, capping or fixing their, uh, their, their income. I would not say that m in, in that extent is uh, real estate is like a typical m and uh, We understand like what Maris and uh, Citadel is doing. I think it's a little bit different uh, from a little bit different perspective. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would say when m and deals are very low, then anyway, something is happening in real estate. 
you know, so that still seems to limited. be more. Still limited because of, I, I guess that investor appetite due to the interest rates, I mean, uh, that just don't match the expectations of the yields they will uh, make because, I mean, uh, all money will probably be cash flow, be a lot of cash flow will go to the banks for uh, for the for the, the for the loans and basically everyone is holding uh, either there is some desperate sales uh, because of I don't know some reasons and but I would guess, guess most of the investors is expecting the lowering uh, interest rates uh, so that they enter again this uh, at least in real estate the market of the selling and buying. I mean I think um, I I don't think it's only co coincidence. I think there is actually de risking if you take international investors into the Baltics and if they can exit at good terms. They rather do it, let's say, during last year rather than wait. Uh, but I think on the real estate, it's a bit sad because there was a big, uh, I think there was a big swing coming out of Germany, moving partly into Baltics because of yield, chasing yield. But that investor club uh, has put every, a lot of things has been put on a pause, at least the ones I've been talking to, uh, unfortunately. But we'll see if it comes back. But I mean, uh, the geopolitics is what it is. and, and uh, yeah, nobody knows when, when or it will be sold. A quick follow-up. What are your predictions for the, this year's m and activity? Yeah, we're coming to that in a minute, yeah. So, um, any other questions yeah. over there? Yes, so mainly to uh, Claudius and Agnesa. So, if airport can reauthorize government-owned companies, would like these IPOs also be viewed as like a a public interest that like uh, maybe the, the offering itself might not be as attractive to the company itself but as an issue, initiative and like a show of liquidity and like in general just uh, throw more attention to what the market that to list these companies even though the listing itself might not be as uh, good, good or like uh, profitable to the company but in like general long term 20 years or so and just I mean, uh, I think for uh, Air Baltic, that's definitely, I mean, because we are competing in a free market, uh, very competitive market, and I mean, uh, uh, I guess the government would want to see the part of the risks are shared, uh, or all the risks are shared with the public market, and uh, and if company grows kind of beyond uh, Latvia and Baltics and uh, Nordics, that's kind of will probably. Uh, I still think that the Baltic is uh, most uh, recognizable brand uh, from Latvia in 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 Europe or in the world because I mean of the of the nature of the business and I, I think uh, that could be kind of attractive uh, uh, investment and I think that. Of course, there is usually this kind of terms when you go to an IPO, then the, the major shareholder should guarantee some kind of liquidity for some uh, certain period and so on. And, and I guess this uh, would be the case here as well, because I mean, otherwise the IPO markets um, deals don't, doesn't happen. But I mean, that's already a separate discussion when we will come uh, to the IPO itself, when what the proportion and the uh, for liquidity should be guaranteed and uh, and so on and for what uh, type and terms and I would say that uh, to be honest this green activities is quite attractive today well, and water is one one of these activities that could be invested all these green topics can be covered by investments uh, you know my personal opinion is that going with air Baltic as uh, the Big ship in the in the shallow waters of Latvian stock exchange is like, okay, but I think like I think, think we are voting yeah. for for Latvian Ergo and Latvian Forest to yes, be first ones. Something like really stable where you can see those cash flows, where people can uh, actually Latvian people I think who are not so risk averse would be interested to invest, because with this uh, Air Baltic. I will personally uh, want to first observe how it goes and then decide on investment. But of course, uh, if, if other governments are investing and they become those anchor investors, so that's promising. But in general, I think uh, uh, that's a mistake. We should go with something smaller 
see how it works, develop this culture, markets, and now, now then when go the always. most interesting uh, questions are, are popping up, we should be wrapping up. So. No, actually, that's a good question to Johan because I mean he's a banker. He probably knows how many investment accounts uh, of his client base have investment accounts. Because I mean to buy any share, you need an investment account. So basically, maybe we start to in incentivizing uh, our potential customer base uh, for investors. Uh, in whatever citadel or uh, Air Baltic to, to start to open investment accounts already. I mean, um, this is where the supply creates uh, the accounts. Uh, one conference ago, there was Enerfit Green case. The Enerfit Green IPO was the reason to open those accounts. Exactly. So it's the trailblazing on the supply yeah. side that creates that. And it's, it's also the simplicity in, in sort of buying that share. But I, I think your, your question is extremely relevant. If I, if I would be the government, I would just say, let's go Latvian Ergo, let's give a very nice discount, let's make sure a lot of the allocation lands locally. We can even sit, you know, a limit on how much the international funds can take, and then make that the, sort of the case study uh, for others. Okay, I think... Yeah, so just, just uh, quickly to add that uh, in 2017, it was estimated that we have more than 10 billion uh, euros in the deposit accounts of the uh, yeah. conservative Latvians here. Yeah, so there is why now most probably it's much more. It's uh, yeah. much more yeah. but okay, before this turns to uh, policy discussion, uh, let's uh, let's wrap up with a very brief answer to from each of you. So this crystal ball section. So that what is your prediction? What's going to happen, if anything, in the next couple of years uh, in Latvia or Baltics in uh, IPO and M&A space? Let's start, Klaus, with you. Uh, I mean, uh, the bond market activity being picking up, uh, and I think that pace will probably continue and more banks will kick in uh, uh, into this market and uh, start to offer as an alternative to the uh, businesses kind of uh, to borrow. I, I think I see some perspective there. Uh, for IPO, definitely, I guess that depends from the first big cases like uh, Air Baltic uh, Citadel success. I mean, if that will be a failure or at least the demand from the local market will be limited, then of course I think the, these markets will still be for 10 years uh, mid-cap or small-cap uh, playground mostly and and uh, we'll still be in 10 years and talking about this 3, 4, 5% of GDP in, uh, in stock investments. Uh, from municipality owned companies, uh, especially in Riga, I would, I, and I'm not to predict that uh, any of companies could uh, go in IPOs uh, during next two years. And there will be some activities in one market, I would say. I mean, um, i usually very careful making predictions, but I think it all starts with the, sort of the overall macro. So if, if we have seen p rates, rates peaking out, if we have seen inflation being sort of controlled, that is the first thing that needs to happen for IPO market to really take off. And then I think I fully agree with you, Klaus. So we need a couple of icebreakers uh, that comes out successfully, and that, then the snowball can start rolling. If that fails, then I don't know where we will end up. Probably the same place as we are today. Uh, unfortunately, I have to share a similar view, but I think what we did not touch today is uh, also where did those Estonians get this money? So, uh, <laughs> most likely crystal ball question. Guess what? So many of them were part of uh, startups that were sold successfully, yes, and uh, uh, even ma maybe not the first figures, they made millions out of it, and uh, uh, and they invested in real estate. Then real estate uh, went up, and they simply have this money to invest. And I think this pretty much also goes back into this uh, question of corporate income taxes. So we all know that in Latvia we were till uh, not so late years paying this in advance, while Estonia was uh, generating equity, accumulating it, and reinvesting. So kind of the companies grew bigger. They were able to buy smaller companies in Latvia who were paying tax in the meantime. So I think uh, there is some transformational change needed in legislation to stimulate uh, the interest. I like the idea of uh, doing uh, IPO of Latvian Ergo at some discount limiting the allocations because I think that could really create uh, change and, and stimulate also those lazy Latvians to pick up the phone and find out what is this stock account. 
Because it is uh, hard uh, for people to switch their thinking from just storing money in their account to, to investing in some uh, companies. And unfortunately, I think most of the companies who are listed uh, in Latvian stock exchange, like Latvia's Gaz, Wallaine Farms, yes, so most of the articles about these companies are in the yellow press. Yes, so which is not really benefiting. Like uh, stories like Enefit Green, uh, there are not so many stories in Latvia, and, and we need to generate these stories, and I really hope that people here listening will make some conclusions and generate more stories like Enefit Green startups or something. Yes, otherwise, we'll be in the same shit where we are today. So, On a yes. positive note, let's let's. On let's a positive here. note, I believe that the bond market is going to develop further. Uh, it's uh, we, we are on the right track about the equity market, so that uh, we're in a bit more challenging position because of the... Uh, our, our plans are just revealed, uh, but we need to prepare. So for, for IPO, you cannot prepare over a day, so you need some time. And uh, as in case of, let's say, Latvenergo, uh, the company is fully prepared. And so that uh, they could... Uh, they could so they, they are on the, strategic, on the strategic way to prepare for the financial markets. They are doing it brilliantly. I really love uh, what is happening. So they could uh, do an IPO. Not any moment. Fast lane has been opened a long time ago. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, yes. So. Uh, uh, Air Baltic also, what I can see is that they are in the process, so they have realized they need to work with the markets, and they are doing it quite actively. Uh, otherwise, uh, for all the other companies, they need at least those two, maybe three years to come to the market, so we cannot just count on this. But uh, uh, if we look, let's say, at Estonia, which announced uh, on the, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the Ministry of Finance that they are going to add one company by one to the equity market starting from 2024, for example, it means that they have already most probably been prepared, which for us is still an exercise. So there is why equity market is still challenging because we just announced our plans. We need some time. So and the time is uh, it's still not 24, not 25, most probably. Okay. Uh, with this, I, 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 I decide to conclude this. So uh, thank you very much, uh, audience, for, for patience. Uh, it seems that we have uh, managed to, uh, to keep you interested and not leave uh, before 7 o'clock uh, as, as we have scheduled. And uh, let's, let's give an applause to, uh, to our panelists.